Amen. All right, as we come to our text tonight, I'd ask you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6 is our text for tonight, and such an appropriate text. We live in a world today where our faith and our Christian lifestyles are becoming less tolerable and more repugnant to the world around us. Our trust and belief in Scripture and in Jesus as the only way to heaven is objectionable to many in their universal, universalist perspectives. That is, so many believing that everyone is going to go to heaven. Or the other side of that, the atheistic perspective, believing that there is no afterlife and that we die and that it's over. And yet we understand that both of these are badly errant. And our understanding of justice is likewise offensive. People find us almost un-American and anarchist when we say that we do not put our trust and our hope in politicians or legal systems or individuals. That we know the ultimate authority and justice comes from God alone and that the government and their power comes from Him. And not from themselves and not from one side or the other of the aisle. And the true justice comes from God alone. And that there is an eternity that each one of us, everyone on this planet will see. The eternity of glory with God and Christ in heaven for those who accept Christ as Savior. And the eternity separated from him and in eternal destruction and punishment for those who reject him. And these messages are not very popular in our world today and continue to be less so. Well, our, our text perfectly aligns with these conditions as this was exactly what Daniel was dealing with. And we come tonight to the last chapter in the first half of the book of Daniel. And you remember that Daniel's broken into two halves, chapters 1 through 6, focusing on history from Daniel's perspective. Daniel, chapter 7 through 12, focusing on prophecy. So here in chapter 6, we come to the conclusion of that section of history. Babylon under Belshazzar has fallen and it has been prophetically spoken about repeatedly in Scripture, as Dr. MacArthur notes, in places like Isaiah 13, Isaiah 47, Jeremiah 50 and 51, Hosea, or Habakkuk chapter 2, all speak about the demise of Babylon. And now we have seen it come to fruition, and Babylon has fallen and the second kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's chapter 2 dream, that five-part statue, has now come to fruition. That in the silver arms and breast, which is Media Persia. Daniel is around 80 years old, and as Dr. Roskup notes, he is still living a vigorous life to the glory of God. I just want to take a moment right there. And every one of you or us that is 60 years old or older, look to Daniel, 80 years old and living a vigorous life for the glory of God. This is what we're called to. Our world may say we're too old. You can't be in this job. You can't be in this arena because this is for the young people. The reality is God has great work for us to do. And Daniel is a beautiful picture of this. 66 years now living in captivity in Babylon and serving the king of Babylon. Well, this takes us to our title for tonight, which I've titled Plots, Plans, and Preeminence. Plots, Plans, and Preeminence. And also what I've arrived at for our theme this evening, four facets of power to affirm your allegiances. Four facets of power to affirm your allegiances. And you'll see those in your prayer guide back in our outline with some area for you to take notes. So as we come to this text, let's take a look at our text this evening. I'm going to read it and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Follow along. Daniel 6, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> 
It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful. And no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows, King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governor have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den. The king replied, The statement is true according to the law of Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or statutes which the king established may be changed. Our first point in our message tonight is a coordinated configuration. A coordinated configuration. Chapter 5 concludes the introduction of Darius the Mede in 531. And it elaborates uh, on his conquest and his conquering of Babylon. Now chapter 6 continues with Darius. Interestingly, verse 31 of chapter 5 is actually verse 1 of chapter 6 in the Aramaic text. Now that should not surprise us. We understand the chapter and verse designations are not inspired. And when we look at the content and context, it would fit either way. Chapter 30 or verse 30 of chapter 5 talks about Belshazzar being slain. Chapter 31 transitions to Darius the Mede and his taking over the kingdom. And now it continues in chapter 6 with Darius. Darius is a, a, heavenly, a heavily contested figure by liberal scholars because he is not mentioned directly in the extra-biblical literature. That is, we don't see the name Darius the Mede in anything that has yet been discovered archaeologically. However, the extra-biblical descriptions do align with the biblical chronology 
and will doubtlessly find a linguistic explanation in in archaeology at some point. That is, when we look at the extra biblical text, it talks about a a, a chief of the army who conquered Babylon. It talks about a governor who came in following the conquest of Babylon and was made the head over Babylon while... Cyrus, who becomes the main figure in prophetic text for Media Persia, is over all of them as king. So we have an identical expression of what the Bible reflects. We just don't see Darius the Mede recorded in the extra biblical text. Keep in mind that this is not a surprise. We are talking about a essentially Hebrew context in the Old Testament an Aramaic section within the Old Testament from chapter 2 through chapter 6 of Daniel or into chapter 7. And then now we have a, a, a Median Persia name being brought in. So there could very easily be a component of either the language of the Medes or the language of the Persians that simply has not been unearth archaeologically to give us that confirmation and that would perfectly align with the other extra biblical texts that describe Darius the Mede. So Darius appoints 120 supervisors over the districts of the kingdom and this aligns well with the 127 districts that we see explained in Esther chapter 1 where King Xerxes, the fourth king of the Media Persia Empire, as we discussed last week and discussed at length in our study on Esther, which you can go back and refresh yourselves on on our church website, and that Xerxes had established 127 districts. Obviously, they had conquered a bit more territory through these kingships, And at this point, there were 120 that had been assigned. As, again, time had gone on and these these had gone forward. Then in chapter 2, over these 120 were to be three commissioners or main ministers. And this made great strategic sense as the 120 that he'd assigned reporting to the king would be a lot of work for the king. We're finding as we looked at the kings of Babylon, of Media, Persia, um, they're not the hard working, put your nose to the grindstone kind of guys. They're more the, I want to hang out in the palace and let everybody else do the work while I lounge around. And so it made sense that he would assign others over the 120 so the king didn't wear himself out, which is what the text says. So each man, each of the three, would supervise assumedly 40. Love my math there, 120 divided by three. I knew you're all wowed at my engineering experience. And these three then would report to the king. So it narrowed dramatically those direct reporters to him. And Daniel was to be one of the three major ministers. Now this was a, a wise move for the king to take Daniel... Uh, the 80-year-old senior statesman out of retirement for service as an overseer. Tanner notes regarding Daniel that he knew well, perhaps better than anyone, the Babylonian kingdom because he had been a high-ranking official in it. He had tremendous integrity and honesty. He furthermore interpreted the dreams of the previous king And he did so through the power of the Most High God. And he also predicted what was going to happen to Babylon through the writing on the wall in chapter 5 that he also interpreted. Well, this distribution of power was also very wise and common. In fact, it's exactly what we see happening in Exodus chapter 18. Do you remember where Moses' father-in-law came to him and saw that Moses was dealing with all of the people and he said, you are going to wear yourself out. You need to appoint people underneath you to deal with this massive group. 
And then you can deal with that. In fact, Jethro said, you should appoint over this whole group those that would be over the thousand. And then over the thousand, you should appoint those that will be over the hundred. And over the hundred, those that are over the tens. So there was this narrowing down in a very similar hierarchy and configuration or structure. And this was a, a, indeed a, a coordinated configuration and a well-coordinated one at that. And in verse 3, Daniel rises to the top. The verb there distinguishing himself as, has a, a continual sense about it, stating that Daniel continually over and over again distinguished himself. It was an ongoing action. Wherever Daniel was, whatever he was doing... He was showing himself noteworthy. He was showing himself above the rest of those that were his peers. And thus, he rose to the top of all the other leaders, both the 120 and the other two of three. And he does so, note in verse 3, because of the extraordinary spirit that he possessed. By the way, that is the same phrase in chapter 5 that the queen mother used as she described Daniel, one of extraordinary spirit. Daniel's abilities, his giftedness, his divine attributes, they stood out and were noticed by the king such that Darius was going to put him over the entire kingdom. Now that is a massive responsibility and certainly came with a tremendous amount of power. Well, amidst even an ungodly and anti-God world, a strong Christian man will stand out. Think of some of those even in our world. Think of Martin Luther King. Think of men like Billy Graham. Think of men like Ben Carson. Perfect men? No, none of us are. But men stood for something regarding the truth of their faith. And they're identified as men of prominence because of what they stood on. The principles and morals of God's word. May the same be said of each of us. Amen. Our second point is a conniving coup. A conniving coup. Well, as... Man is distinguishing himself as Daniel is being distinguished, so he also will be attacked. And in verse 4, the other two, the 120, find something to discredit Daniel. Now, there was nothing corrupt as Daniel was reliable and a man of integrity, as verse 4 tells us. And this was because he was committed to serving and honoring God. Their pursuit of corruption is the main point of verse 4. And in fact, we see that verb used twice in verse 4, confirming for us its emphasis as well as uh, a a Hebrew accent or or an Aramaic accent confirming that. It's interesting as well that unrighteous people will stop at nothing to tear down the righteous. When they could find nothing of him in the kingdom, that was not enough for them. And this is just what's going on in 2 Corinthians where Paul is defending his apostleship. And for those of you that are in our men's and ladies Bible study, you're getting an excellent exposure to this incredible text. For those of you that aren't, I want to encourage you. It is still a great place to step in and understand um, just not quite halfway through the book yet all that is going on in that and how Paul is having to defend his apostleship because he too, as a righteous man, is being attacked. Well, in verse 5, they recognize the only avenue they have is in Daniel's faith. Everyone knows of Daniel's unshakable resolve in his faith to God. So in verse 6, they'd conceived of a coup and they'd connived an attack against Daniel. And the plan entailed worship of only King Darius for 30 days. This would, of course, appeal to the king's pride. 
your counselors come to you and say, we want everybody in the kingdom to worship only you for 30 days and no other God. Well, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Yeah, I'd get behind that. 30 days of 120 different provinces worshiping me. Yeah, let's do that. I like it. So Darius is all about that. This very much appeals to his pride. But as one commentator notes, this was also a pretty brilliant request. It was very reasonable. Think of what's just happened. Media Persia has just taken over the entire Babylonian Empire as a way to show solidarity and to show support for the king, putting aside their pagan worship. Keep in mind, there were probably hundreds of different gods and, and different elements that they worshipped. So putting those aside to worship this one God and doing so for 30 days, well, that wasn't huge. So, okay, that probably would be palatable and it would help reinforce and bolster the kingdom of Media Persia. So this really was a fairly brilliant request that came up with a relatively short time frame, uh, attention on the new king and the empire, and then would allow them to return to their normal worship in a short amount of time. Of course, they put some teeth behind it, literally, with the lion's den that they would be thrown into if anyone didn't do this. So they, of course, lied in verse 7 as it said that all of the officials had agreed. We're missing one, aren't we? I'm pretty sure Daniel was not there and in agreement. So they lied to the king that everybody was there. And somehow the king missed that, that Daniel was there. And we might say, well, how could that be where this is the man that's going to be placed number one over the kingdom? Well, recognize that there could have been over a hundred people that had asked for an audience in front of the king. So identifying one is something that might easily have gone by the wayside. And in verse 8, they'd already had the document written. And they urged the king to sign it and to put it into law so that it could not be changed. And we remember we saw this over and over again back in the book of Esther. That when a law was made, that it was irrevocable in that part of the ancient world. This was the law of the Medes and Persians. It was also the law that we saw of Babylon. So this was how they did things. When a law was made, it could not be revoked. And in verse 9, the king does so. The king does so. And this is a conniving coup that is launched. And it takes us on to our third point, which I have titled, A Careless Consideration, beginning in verse 10. A careless consideration. Now, this is not careless with respect to lack of attentiveness, but rather lack of concern. I don't care. I'm not worried about this. So when we think of a careless consideration, Daniel knew what had happened. And we see his response in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed... He entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Several wonderful details come up regarding this verse. I mean, you could do probably a couple messages on this verse. But we're just going to bounce across a few highlights. First though, Daniel went out on the roof to pray. In that day and age in Babylon, you're in an area that is an extremely hot desert climate. We know that the, the city has just been conquered. We know that wars only took place essentially during the late spring to early winter. So it's probably very hot, much like it is that time of year in our Arizona, only even more so. So the roof is where people made a, a place to live. They often would put trellises up and cover it with plantings and they would leave openings in those plantings such that any breeze that was there would help cool them off as they would also be in the shade. 
So Daniel goes up on this roof. Now, recognize that he could have stayed inside. He knows what was going on. He knew the document had been signed. But he is not going to hide away. His enemies are looking and watching, but he did not care. Daniel was going to stand for his faith and for the truth of God regardless. It says that the roof had openings facing Jerusalem. And this was the direction of Daniel's prayer. Now this shows Daniel's knowledge of the scripture. It shows his righteousness and it shows that he was a pious man. Daniel understood what had been written in God's word as Solomon dedicated the first temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. Go sometime and read 1 Kings 6 through 8. It is a brilliant section of scripture that shows Solomon really at, I believe, the pinnacle of his wisdom immediately after the temple is concluded and before he started pursuing some of his vain endeavors. And Solomon writes and, and dedicates and prays for the temple. And he does so in the most brilliant fashion. And in that prayer of dedication for the temple, Solomon prophetically talks about how, when, as he's praying to God, when your people are taken captive because they sin and all sin and you know it, and when you send them as exiles... And when they pray to this house, hear them and restore them. And it is the most brilliant prayer. And the people who were listening, if they were listening at all, had to be going, wait a minute, we're at the pinnacle of our glory. Israel is bigger than it's ever been. We have this massive edifice of a temple on the Temple Mount. And now you're saying when we're taken exile? But that's exactly what he said. And Daniel knew that. And so Daniel is faithful. They have been exiled. And he is praying to Jerusalem. Lifting up the truth of God's word. The temple is gone. In fact, it's been destroyed for almost 50 years. But Daniel is still praying that direction as God has said. You know, how important is this, beloved? when we think about our prayers for unsaved family members. Sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we think maybe the Lord's not hearing anymore. As I pray for my brother living in, in immorality, as we pray for wives or husbands, as we pray for children, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, and we, we, become, we become tired of that. Oh, Lord, they're just never going to get it. Beloved, don't ever stop. Don't ever allow yourself to think that it is not the most important thing that you can do to be bringing your request before God. Is it changing God's mind? No. But what it is doing, it is changing your heart. It is giving you a renewed and refreshed vigor to reach out to those unsaved loved ones. Maybe God will place upon your mind a, a way to interact with them that you've not thought of before. Maybe you, like me, have approached your unsaved loved ones as I did my brother and you tried the Nicodemus approach and so you took the four by four and you slapped him up alongside the head and it didn't work. He just got really mad and so they don't want to talk to you. Well, maybe God will use that as a way as you pray and as you plead for their salvation to open their eyes. Daniel prayed for 50 years to this temple that had been destroyed, and longer. Second, Daniel prays three times a day. And just as he's always done at the end of verse 10 shows us, this shows us this was not ritualism. Now, David did say that they should pray to God three times a day. But that's not what Daniel is doing, simply going through the motions. It wasn't even just faithful prayer, although it was that. But it was so much more. This was resolute reliance and trust in God. Beloved, this is how we must live our lives. Our lives must be so focused and so centered on God that prayer is a constant in our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us, pray without ceasing. Yes, yes. 
Our lives are, are to be saturated with prayer, continually coming before the throne of grace with our needs. Daniel knew of the prescribed 70 years of captivity for the Sabbath violations prescribed in Jeremiah 25.11. By the way, that was 490 years. From the time of Saul to the time of the Babylonian captivity, Israel had failed as a nation to observe God's Sabbaths. How important was that for them? I would say huge. Some have said, well, you know, we don't celebrate the Sabbath anymore. No, we do not. One of the Ten Commandments not listed in the New Testament is that we would observe the Sabbath. Instead, we honor the Lord's day, don't we? How important is it for us to focus on that? And we have become so small in our understanding of giving a day to God, a day to focus on Him. Yes, the Jewish Pharisees took that way too far and made it ridiculous legalism, but perhaps we have erred in going way too far the other way. I'll go to church some Sundays. You know, I feel like it and get out of bed if the service is at the right time. I'll go to one service, but I'm certainly not going to two An hour and a half, that's a long time to be at church. How important is it that we are focused on God's word and honoring him on his day? How big is it that we have fellowship, that we come together, that we grow in Christ and grow in his word and grow in one another? What else is there? What else will have eternal significance? Nothing, nothing. Daniel is kneeling In his prayer, there are several attitudes of prayer in Scripture. There's standing, there's sitting, there's lying prostrate. But kneeling has a unique element of a servant who is showing himself willing to allow God in this humble fashion to work in his heart. And he is specifically giving thanks to God in his prayer. The the preposition before God is literally in the presence of God. Do you recognize that? When we come to God in prayer, we are in His very presence. This was the thing that so struck me about Del Tackett in his first lesson on the Truth Project. At the conclusion of that message, he had that great theme that he put through all of those Truth Project videos that if we really believe that what we believe is really real, how will we live? That if we really believe that what we believe is really real, how will we live? If we really believe, beloved, that when we come to God in prayer, we enter into the holy of holies, into the throne room of God, and we enter into intimate and divine communion with Him, The problem is not going to be how much time we spend in prayer. The problem is going to be getting out of prayer. Because is there anything better than being in the presence of our God? Certainly not. Well, Daniel's careless consideration changed to the other meaning in verse 11. And that being careless with respect to lack of attention or consideration. And there in verse 11, the conspirators had been awaiting Daniel's response. And they got it. They found him making petition and supplication. They were close enough to hear the content of his prayer. Because in addition to the thanksgiving, we see in verse 10, it tells us in verse 11 that they knew that he was pleading and asking of God. The verb in verse 11 of their coming by agreement confirms that this was a plot. And as one version well translated, they came by collusion, indicating the conspiracy. We'll see more of that in a moment. In verses 12 to 13, the conspirators discuss with the king about the decree. And they first carefully question the king as to the content of the law of the decree. And the king affirms the contents and that the decree is further irrevocable in verse 12. 
Then in verse 13, they drop the bomb and confirm their trap where it says, Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making petition three times a day. They've got him. Daniel has violated the irrevocable law. Well, this takes us to our fourth point, a keyed up concern. A keyed up concern. Beginning in verse 14, the king's distress was not displeasure with Daniel, but with the conspirators. He suddenly recognized that he'd been duped. They weren't honoring the king. They weren't trying to create unity. They were simply trying to destroy one who they perceived as an enemy and who they hated. The king wanted to find a way to release Daniel. And he continued to try to find a way to do so until sunset, as verse 14 tells us. This time indicator confirms for us also that by the law of the Medes and Persians in general, at sunset, judgment had to occur. They had to move forward on the violation of the law. The conspirators confirmed the injunction in verse 15. These men came and agreed to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king established may be changed. We note here that after they told the king about Daniel's offense, they leave And the king has time to think about this. And then they come back again in verse 15 and tell him that this is indeed the irrevocable law and to remind him of that. Well, it's pretty bleak for Daniel. And we certainly see why the king has a keyed up concern. But before we conclude, I want to draw your attention to two different verbs that occur throughout our text that give us a wonderful indication of what's going on. The first verb occurs in verse 6, 11, and 15. 6, 11, and 15. And if you look at those verses, you'll see the phrase, came by agreement. Came by agreement. The literal translation of that Aramaic, bur- of that Aramaic verb is to be tumultuous or in an uproar. The verb confirms for us that the state of the heart and mind of the assailants to righteous Daniel. They were tumultuous in their hearts and minds. Not externally, because the king would not put up with that. But internally, there was a turmoil. There was an anger. There was a rage. There was a violence. There was a wildness. They would do anything necessary. And it was a settled position of their hearts and minds upon which they were in agreement. And the action of those seeking to remove and tear down and even destroy men who stand for truth is just this way. And it was this way in Daniel's time and it is this way in our time. When good men stand unyielding on God's word and will not bow to unprincipled men, and instead call out their offenses, this is just the response. Tumultuous, lawless, unruly, violent vengeance. It's a horrific situation. And it happens in the church all the time. Again, exactly what Paul was dealing with in 2 Corinthians. Go read his account of his afflictions in chapter 5. And in chapters 11 and 12, stunning. But there's another verb also used three times. And we see this in verse 5, 11, and 13. In verse 5, it is translated as find it against him. In the context, finding something against Daniel and against Daniel's God. And then in verses 11 and 13, it's translated as making petition. This is the identical Aramaic verb in all three cases. 
And the context in verses 11 and 13 is Daniel seeking after God. So in verse 5, they're seeking to find something against Daniel and against his God. And then in verse 11 and 13, they are reporting that very thing that Daniel is seeking God. And what we have here is a very unique grammatical device where the meaning of the word is being reversed. The meaning of the word in its context is being reversed. In the first usage, they are seeking to find something against Daniel and his God. Then they find that it is that very thing that they will turn around and use against him in verses 11 and 13. And that as he is pursuing after God, this will be the accusation. Just as the conspirators seek to find something against Daniel and our inspired author shows us that at the same time they reverse that positive aspect to say that Daniel will thus be accused because he was in fact seeking his God. This reversal is critical for us to understand because we return next time to the conclusion of chapter 6. One thing we'll recognize is that as they sought to reverse that effect of God seeking Daniel, of Daniel seeking God, excuse me, and that that was his offense, God will reverse it and it will come against them at the end of our text as God's sovereignty and his justice always work out. One thing we can always rest in, beloved, is that although we live in a world that is largely contrary to our faith, one in which there is much plotting and planning, nothing can thwart the preeminent word and plan of our God. And we must rest in that and understand that as Daniel was righteous and faithful to honor God, this is what we must be as well. Let me share with you very familiar words from the benediction of Jude as we close. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. May God be glorified that whatever comes our way, we will stand as righteous men and women amongst a perverse generation and that God will be glorified and that they will see as they did with Daniel something different amongst us. Father, thank you for the recognition of who we're to be, of what we're to look like and how we are to act. God, it is such an amazing parallel to see all that Daniel is going through and all that is going on in our world. And Lord, we, like Daniel, seek to honor you. We seek to glorify you. We seek to live lives of obedience to you, not so that we might be seen as righteous, not so that we might be seen as obedient, but so that you might be lifted up so that the dead and dying world around us would recognize that there is a God in heaven who reigns, who holds their lives in his hands and who desires that they would come to the saving knowledge of his son, our Savior, as the Lord. Father, help us to be faithful as Daniel was faithful. Help us to be faithful in prayer. Help us to be faithful in action. Help us to be faithful in speech. And Lord, above all this, may you be pleased with what we do because it is all about you. And we praise you for the chance that we have to understand these truths, to grow in them and to be encouraged, Father. So may each one be encouraged today. May we go in the power of Christ tonight. May we recognize the importance of the gospel, preaching it to ourselves and to all who would hear and all for your glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.